In this video, we're going to take a look at the offence of theft. Section 1 of the Theft Act 1968 states, person is guilty of theft if he dishonestly appropriates property belonging to another with the intention of permanently depriving the other of it. Put another way, you could say the ingredients of theft are dishonest appropriation of property belonging to another with the intention to permanently deprive. Not theft. Still not theft. Theft. Now we'll take a look at these ingredients one at a time. Dishonestly. Mens rea. Section 2. A person's appropriation of property belonging to another is not to be regarded as dishonest. A. If he appropriates the property in the belief that he has in law the right to deprive the other of it on behalf of himself or a third person. Or B. If he appropriates the property in the belief that he would have the other's consent if the other knew of the appropriation or circumstances of it. Or C. Except where the property came to him as trustee or personal representative, if he appropriates property in the belief that the person to whom the property belongs cannot be discovered by taking reasonable steps. The leading case on dishonesty is regarded as the Crown vs. Ghosh from 1982. In this case, the Lord Chief Justice Lane stated that in determining whether the prosecution has proved that the defendant was acting dishonestly, the jury must first of all decide whether, according to the ordinary standards of reasonable and honest people, what was done was dishonest. If it was not dishonest by those standards, that is the end of the matter and the prosecution fails. Lord Lane went to lay down the second limb of the ghost test. If it was dishonest by those standards, then the jury must consider whether the defendant himself must have realised that what he was doing was, by those standards, dishonest. However, the 2017 civil case of Ivy vs Genting Casinos, which was decided by the Supreme Court, has overruled the second part of the ghost test. Lord Hughes, when dishonesty is in question, the fact-finding tribunal must first ascertain, subjectively, the actual state of the individual's knowledge or belief as to the facts. The reasonableness or otherwise of his belief is a matter of evidence, going to whether he held the belief, but it is not an additional requirement that his belief must be reasonable. The question is whether it is genuinely held. When once his actual state of mind as to knowledge or belief as to facts is established, the question whether his conduct was honest or dishonest is determined by the fact finder by applying the objective standards of ordinary decent people. There is no requirement that the defendant must appreciate that what he has done is by those standards dishonest. Appropriates. I mean, to take something. Part of the actus reus. Theft. Section 3, subsection 1. Any assumption by a person of the rights of an owner amounts to an appropriation, and this includes where he has come by the property, innocently or not, without stealing it, any later assumption of a right to it by keeping or dealing with it as owner. In the case of Pittam and Hale, it was explained that there is no need to physically touch property in order to appropriate it. In this case, the act of inviting people to a house to buy furniture belonging to another was held to be an appropriation. Section 4. Property. Part of the Actus Reus. Property includes money and all other property, real or personal, including things in action and other intangible property. <laughs> things in action and other intangible property mean things such as rights. Examples can include debts, shares in a company, or even money stored in a bank account. If I were to take this rock, it wouldn't be theft. Or would it? Regarding property, section 4 subsection 2 states that a person cannot steal land or things forming part of land and severed from it by him or by his directions, except in the following cases. b. When he is not in possession of the land and appropriates anything forming part of the land by severing it or causing it to be severed or after it has been severed. Sever, for this purpose, means divide by cutting or slicing or simply removing. This rock is arguably the property of the National Trust, but it would be hoped that my appropriation of it as a souvenir of a fine day's climbing in Snowdonia would not be regarded as dishonest by the standards of ordinary people under Gauche and later Ivy vs Genting Casinos. If I were to take this piece of flora and fauna, it wouldn't be theft, or would it? Section 4 subsection 3 states that a person who picks mushrooms growing wild on any land or who picks flowers, fruit, or foliage from a plant growing wild on any land, does not, although not in possession of the land, steal what he picks, unless he does it for reward, or for sale, or other commercial purpose. So in other words, if I take this piece of foliage and later go on to sell it, 
that could potentially be regarded as theft. What about animals? Section 4 subsection 4 states that wild creatures, tamed or untamed, shall be regarded as property. But a person cannot steal a wild creature, not tamed nor ordinarily kept in captivity, or the carcass of any such creature, unless either it has been reduced into possession by or on behalf of another person, and possession of it has not since been lost or abandoned, or another person is in course of reducing it into possession. You cannot be guilty of theft for taking a wild creature. However, such matters may be covered by laws relating to poaching. In the case of deer, see the Deer Act 1991. And as for slugs, well, I don't know about them. Stealing this, would this be theft? Clack Eaton was the site of a very strange case in the law where somebody was actually charged with uh, trying to steal a railway station. Today it partially appears to be the site of a uh, Tesco car park. Tesco itself, I've found out, doesn't actually have any customer toilets. 1972, a man appeared at Wakefield Crown Court charged with theft. He was alleged to have stolen stone, timber, metal, buffer stops and seats, in addition to 135 yards, approximately 123.5 metres, of railway track. Counsel for the prosecution, Mr R Irvine, stated, It boils down to the theft of a railway station, purely and simply. It was later acquitted, but this just goes to show that the uh, definition of property under the law can be quite broad. The case of the Crown against Turner, number 2970. The defendant was alleged to have stolen his own car from the garage where it was being repaired. In this case, the correct question to be put to the jury was held to be, did the garage in fact have possession or control of the car at the time of the appropriation? The defendant was found guilty. Section 6. Intention to permanently deprive. Section 6, subsection 1. A person appropriating property belonging to another without meaning the other permanently to lose the thing itself is nevertheless to be regarded as having the intention of permanently depriving the other of it if his intention is to treat the thing as his own to dispose of regardless of the other's rights, and a borrowing or lending of it may amount to so treating it if, but only if, the borrowing or lending is for a period and in circumstances making it equivalent to an outright taking or disposal. Lavender, 1994. The defendant took two doors from a council house and installed them in his girlfriend's house, which was owned by the same council. This was held to be theft, as the defendant had treated the doors as if they were his own, within the meaning of Section 6. Thank you.